imagine if Alice hadn't gone down the rabbit hole? And what if Lucy's curiosity hadn't inspired her to explore the world beyond the wardrobe and discover Narnia? What a loss for all of us. What wonderful worlds we would never have experienced. Imagine just for a moment how different our lives would be without the magic of curiosity. It's that wonderful, uninhibited quality that we possess as kids that leads us on so many wonderful adventures. For me, as a photographer today, whenever I explore an abandoned building or a long forgotten ghost town, I feel just like Lucy, tugging the sheet away from the wardrobe. That's when I get to discover what lies beyond their shuttered facades and their great big wire fences. And best of all, I get to photograph what lies beyond. For so many of us, our curiosity gets lost along the way. Today, I'd like to talk about curiosity and how perhaps you can reignite your own. Because as I said, we all lose it, me included, for a while. But best of all, I get to chat about all the cool places that I get to photograph. When I was a kid, I was always off exploring with my little sister Nicole on our bikes. We would be gone from dawn till dusk, and thankfully I grew up in an era where we could be. And we would only return home for dinner when we heard Dad's whistle. And it was so piercing, you could hear it from blocks away. So we would race home. And one of my most vivid memories was when I explored the Morning Star Boys Home in Mount Eliza, the Melbourne suburb where I grew up. We often went past the boys' home on the way to the beach uh, with Mum and Dad. And I was always fascinated. There was this great big wrought iron gate, and there were big stone pillars and a great big fence, and when you look through the gate, all you could see was a glimpse of this big Victorian mansion. And to a kid, it was just irresistible. And I remember the Franciscan brothers, they ran the boys' home, and it closed and became abandoned in about 1975. And I was nine, and I was told by my parents in no uncertain terms that I was not allowed in there. So clearly, I already had a history. It, it took... It took a couple of years for those warnings to wear off and for my curiosity to get the better of me, as it still does today. And I, I conned my younger sister and a couple of our childhood friends into figuring out how to get into the boys' home to explore it. Well, we couldn't just waltz through the gates because they were all chained up. So we figured out that we had to climb the cliff on the beach. So. It was quite the production for four little girls, believe me. We had to climb a great big cliff on Sunnyside Beach. And then once we got to the top of the beach, the top of the cliff, there was a great big hedge there and it was super, super thick. And we hadn't thought about that when we were down on the ground. We didn't realise it was there, but we pushed our way through. And we were finally on the grounds and we were exploring the outer buildings. And I've got to tell you, we were terrified. We were absolutely petrified. We were four very silly little girls. But the one thing I remember was the adrenaline rush. And not when I was 11 or 12, I didn't know what an adrenaline rush was. But it was the feeling of getting to see what so few people get to see. And that's how I feel today, whenever I'm exploring an abandoned building or photographing one. It's just, just this wonderful feeling of knowing that I'm seeing something that so few people do. Like so many of us, my curiosity got waylaid by everyday life, running a business, paying bills, building a grown-up life. By my mid to late 20s, my curious nature had all but disappeared, and my adventuresome spirit had got lost in the inevitable. My passion for photography had lost its passion. And if you had told me then that 25 odd years later, I would be living on the other side of the world, teaching photography to college students and authoring photographic books about America's abandoned history, I would have laughed at you. And if you told me even six months ago that I would ever, ever do a TEDx talk, I would have laughed even harder. <laughs> because I do scary things on a fairly regular basis, but I don't think I've ever, ever done anything this scary. So let's see if I can get through it. I'm gonna fast forward ahead now a couple of decades, and it's 2007, and I, I'm living in Baltimore, Maryland, and I'm studying for my MFA in Integrated Design at the University of Baltimore. I have a wonderful professor and mentor, um, 
a great instructor, Ed Gold. And he gave our theory of communications class some really wonderful advice. And I still pass this advice on to my students today. He told us, or he asked us, that each day for the entire semester, if we would do one thing differently, or try something new each day, he said, take a different route to work or to school. Maybe go down a side street you've never been down. Take the long way home, he said, slow down. He also suggested it could be something as different, as simple as trying a different food. Try something that you're convinced that you don't like. You know, if you've never read a book in a horror genre, read one. Maybe you like horror books. Likewise, movies. Perhaps you're a romantic comedy fan. We'll go see a sci-fi film. He coached us that as visual communicators, we needed to be knowledge sponges. Be curious, he said. Well, Ed's words of wisdom came to mind when I was tossing around ideas for my MFA thesis project. I took Ed words, Ed's words to heart, and I often went the long way home. And one of my long way home trips took me past an abandoned paper mill. It was in Ellicott City. It sat on the banks of the Patapsco River. And it was built in the late 1800s, early 1900s, Thistle Mill. And I had been past many, many times, and you'll never guess what, I was curious about what was inside, but I had never been in there. So I decided to channel my 11-year-old me and take my camera on an adventure. Well, Thistle Mill was the beginning of many, many beautiful places that I would photograph in Baltimore, all abandoned, just breathtakingly beautiful. I know some people don't see the beauty in the abandoned buildings, I do. And it was also the beginning of my thesis project, Spirits of the Abandoned. And when I was working on um, my project, I'm just like my students now who are getting ready to graduate, and you just want to be done and you want to get it over and done with so you can get on with your life. But instead, my thesis project has become my life's work. In 2018, a very unexpected surprise, I received a publishing contract from a, a UK publisher to publish my photography and the stories of the abandoned buildings that I explore. They were doing a series on abandoned America and to say I was wildly excited is an understatement. The opportunity to do the books was wonderful because it gave me a chance to revisit so many of the places that I had photographed 10 years earlier. Some of them are worse off than they were. Some of them have been restored. Many of them have been destroyed by fire and vandals. It's really sad. And one of them came to mind when I was preparing this talk because the similarity between the boys' school back home in Mount Eliza in Australia and the Jacob Tome School, which is in Port Deposit in Maryland, it, it really hit me. It's like, wow, history really sort of does repeat itself. So the Jacob Tome School was once um, considered America's richest school. It was built in the early 1900s. And guess what? It's way up high on a cliff. So <laughs> I had to set off up another cliff. And the biggest difference that I can tell you was my knees. <laughs> my 11-year-old my knees and my 40-plus-year-old knees had a very different cliff climbing experience. I, I can tell you, I hurt for days. And I could talk forever about all my adventures on the East Coast. I have photographed some amazing places I'm incredibly grateful for. But I really want to talk to you today about Arizona. In 2013, I moved to Arizona to take up my dream job at Central Arizona College, where I am now, teaching photography and design. And initially, you would think that Arizona and Baltimore couldn't be further apart. And they can't. You, know, you think, well, the streets of Baltimore, beautiful Arizona. And they are different. But interestingly, they share what so many of our cities and towns do, remnants of our past, which we seem to be in such a hurry to just move on from and leave behind. Curiosity can help us see some of these things. One of the most interesting places in Arizona that I photographed, and I'm sure many of you will know it because it was really an Interstate 10 icon, was the Phoenix Trotting Park. It was massive and it was way ahead of its time in its construction and its planning. And it was in Litchfield Park, so when you were heading out of Phoenix on the way to Los Angeles, you would see it and likewise when you were coming home, and that's why people saw it as somewhat of an icon. In 2017, the Trotting Park had been abandoned for a little over 50 years. 
and it had sat vacant and largely inaccessible. And 1965, when it was built, it actually cost $10 million to build. But in 2017, it was demolished in two or three days. All that's left is rubble. And it really makes you wonder. Arizona, of course, is also home to ghost towns, which are wonderful. I didn't realize that there were so many, and they're awesome. And there are our old mining towns. And interestingly, we leave behind the very infrastructure that supported the people who lived there. There are schools, there are towns, there are jails, there's saloons. And Ruby in particular comes to mind. It's, it's not a well-known ghost town. It's not a touristy ghost town like Tombstone. It's, it's way down south. It's about 20 minutes or so from the southern border. And it claims to have the most standing buildings of any ghost town in Arizona. And it's, it's a very cool place to visit. I highly recommend it. And the schoolhouse is still there. It's perfect. Uh, they are restoring it. The jail is intact. And there's also the skeletal remains of the general store. And in the 1920s, several really brutal murders took place there. And it just it remains as a very haunted reminder of just how violent some of these mining towns and ghost towns were. By now, I imagine you're wondering, OK, this curiosity thing is all well and good, but abandoned buildings and ghost towns just don't do it for me. That's not going to inspire my curiosity. And I understand that. We're all different. Something will excite your curiosity. I want to get you thinking about how you could perhaps inspire your own curiosity. Maybe you could do as my Professor Ed suggested and do just that one thing differently every day. Who knows where it could lead? You might take a different route to work or a different way to school or take that side street. There might be a park or a trail that you've never been on. You might discover a bookstore that you've never been to. Who knows? Try something different. Even if you don't push yourself to do it every day, maybe try and do it just once a week. I want to share a conversation that I had on Friday night. Um, I had to add this into my talk because um, I thought it was relevant. I was giving a talk about my book, uh, the, Arizona, the Abandoned Arizona book, in Flagstaff at the Pioneer Museum. And I was chatting away about chloride. Chloride's another ghost town with a great history. And it's on the way to Vegas. So you see the sign for chloride. And it was really cool when I was leaving, a gentleman came up to me and he said, I want to thank you. He said, I have driven past that sign to chloride so many times and I've never stopped. And I've driven home and I've never stopped. He said, I'm always in a hurry to get to a show in Vegas or I'm always in a hurry to get home. And he said, now you've made me want to go there. I, I told them all about chloride itself, as I said, is fascinating. But if you go about a mile or so out of town, there's a canyon and there are all these boulders and they were painted in the 1960s by an artist called Roy Purcell. And they are so stunningly vibrant and colourful. They're just wonderful. So anyway, he is off to see the boulders with the paintings on them now. And it really resonated with me because it made me think about today. And I thought, wow, I hope I have this effect on people on Thursday because I wasn't really trying to do that last Friday. I was simply chatting about the history. So it was really cool and I, and I hope that I, I do, I hope I make you curious ab about what is in your own state. In closing, you know, we think about the unseen as what the world has hidden, what, we, what is hidden from us. But the unseen isn't just about that, it's also about what we've stopped seeing. Curiosity can help us see those things again. If you just take the time every now and then, to maybe look around at what you're not noticing. We miss out on so much in our everyday rush. We are multitasking our imaginations into non-existence. Be curious. Head down the rabbit hole once in a while. I highly recommend it. Thank you.